Good morning or good afternoon, wherever you may be. Uh, I'm Pete Peterson, the Dean of Pepperdine's Graduate School of Public Policy. And we are coming to you live from classroom LC155 here on our Malibu campus at Pepperdine's Graduate School of Public Policy. We are about to start our second session of the day in our Live from Malibu April short courses. And I'm delighted to be joined again by Dr. Gordon Lloyd, our Professor Emeritus and Doxson Professor of Public Policy, who will lead a second session on what is going to be a four class series on the roots of capitalism versus socialism. If this is your first time to one of these classes, we are utilizing the Zoom online platform uh, to deliver this content. Uh, it is intended to be interactive, but given the size of uh, the class and the number of participants, I wanted to tell you just very briefly about the format for these courses. Uh, we are going to be uh, led by Dr. Lloyd uh, for the first 40, 45 minutes or so in a lecture on the subject matter. Today we'll be exploring the impact and philosophy of Adam Smith. And then we'll be reserving the last 15 minutes for your questions. Again, due to the class size, we'll be utilizing the chat feature for your questions. And so if you look at the bottom of your screen, you'll see a chat button. If you click on that and open it up, you should have the opportunity to type in your question. And in the last 15 minutes of the class, I'll be moderating those questions with Dr. Lloyd. We ask that you mute your video as well as your microphone. And those buttons should be in the lower left-hand corner of your screen. Just a little bit uh, about Dr. Lloyd for those who, again, may be the first time. Dr. Lloyd is our, uh, as I mentioned, Professor Emeritus, Doxson Professor here at the School of Public Policy. He is the co-author, co uh, uh, co-author of three books just on the American founding. He is the sole author of a book on political economy of the New Deal. He has written widely numerous articles and reviews and opinion editorials. Uh, he is the author or co-author of uh, several recent books, including 2019's How Policy Became War uh, and Rugged Individualism, Dead or Alive in 2017, The New Deal and Modern American Conservatism, A Defining Rivalry in 2013, he wrote, writing those books with David Davenport. This short course is based on uh, a couple of his very popular uh, books on political economy, including his uh, much beloved graduate class, Political Economy, which uh, Dr. Lloyd has taught here at the school for many years. You'll see noted one of uh, the particular books he's written with Nicholas Capaldi, Two Narratives of Political Economy from 2011. As we always do, following this lecture, all of you who have registered, we will be emailing you the recorded session of this discussion, along with links to several of the books uh, Dr. Lloyd will be mentioning today, including this co-authored uh, volume, Two Narratives of Political Economy. So without any further ado, we uh, bring you live here into the classroom with Dr. Lloyd, and welcome Dr. Lloyd for today's class. Good morning, Peter. Good morning to all of you out there. This is delightful that we have this conversation. And when Pete says uh, this is going to be a lecture, those of you who know me know that uh, I need to be shut up from time to time. Therefore, I enjoy <laughs> questions. So I can get back on track. Uh, so, yes, the last 15 minutes will be reserved, but that will not exclude you from asking or writing or chatting in between. And Pete is very difficult to keep quiet also. So I am delighted to be here to converse with you about this, uh, this, this topic. Last week, we talked about John Locke and Jean-Jacques Rousseau. And the question is obviously, well, why start there? You could start, we have to start a narrative or a story somewhere. And we started, on time usually as a matter of 
of courtesy, and we end on time as a matter of business. So we have to start somewhere. So the reason I'm talking, starting with John Locke is that he understands that the improvement in the arts and useful sciences, that improvement is critical for improving the human condition. So that becomes the purpose. How do we increase the human condition? Just, you know, I don't know if you remember this nursery rhyme. I, I, I remember it well, but the days um, and, and sort of fade in, in, in time. Uh, there's a story about Solomon Grundy. Solomon Grundy, born on Monday, uh, took ill on Tuesday, got worse on Wednesday, um, died on Thursday, buried on Friday. That is the life of Solomon Grundy. And John Locke, <laughs> I'm thinking, does that have to be the life that we live? Hmm. And so one way to improve the human condition is to is to give people incentives. Now, do they have it in themselves, or do you have to put incentives in them? And I think Locke's point is that it's in there because we have a natural inclination, and therefore a natural right, to self-preservation, and decent self-preservation, not just minimal existence. And that requires then economics, which in its Greek sense meant management of the household, that means economics is going to become more important. It's going to come out of the household and into the world. And I think that is part of the birth of political economy instead of household economy. By political, it doesn't necessarily mean that the government will do everything. It means it comes out of one sphere, which is sort of private, into the public sphere. And yet Locke retains private so that the political and the private are mixed in law. Now, we also start with Jean-Jacques Rousseau, and he was the one, who, in my opinion, very early on introduced the term political economy. And it meant that economics was out there, out of the household, but he questioned whether the development of the arts and sciences were good for human beings. Weren't human beings better off living a simple, decent, life in accordance with nature that was friendly. Locke understood nature to be something to be conquered or used, not just laying rest out there doing nothing. I, what good is that? And, and I think Rousseau's point is, is it, that's, exactly, that's exactly right. So we have two choices. We either really make this political in the sense we're all involved, or we drop out and become hermits and live on, live on the edge. And I think Rousseau's challenge to Locke is proof to me that private property is the result of work rather than theft. Prove to me that the contract which people have made is genuinely uh, democratic rather than great. And so Rousseau leaves that legacy of doubt. So it's not so much, and I've been thinking about this since our last session, it's not so much that Rousseau spells out everything, save for Marx, but he, but he plants right at the beginning the notion that maybe this is not as good as we're trying to make it. So it has some defects or a downside to it. And Locke is full of hope and Rousseau is, is, is pessimistic about this. And I think if we just take that forward with us as we go, the, the hope and the pessimism, the, uh, that, that kind of motif, I think is important. So we get to Adam Smith. And Adam Smith wrote a book in, and it published in 1776, which has become famous. And it, 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 the full title is an inquiry into the nature and causes of the wealth of nature. And he also wrote another book called The Theory of Moral Sentiments. And what exactly the relationship is between those two books contain a lifetime of pondering. And the reason why it seems to be so ponderous for people is that the wealth of nations, it is said by these ponderers, the wealth of nations is a book without values. It's a book that somehow 
It may be even selfish if it has a value, but it's just dealing with markets and money and that sort of thing. Whereas the theory of moral sentiments deals with ethics and morality. How can the same person write a book without morality and a book with morality? As the German scholars call it, that's Adam Smith's problem. <laughs> so, that, so we have a, we, we could spend the rest of the time dealing with that. Um, so what I'm going to try to do is to suggest that the wealth of nations is not quite as devoid of values as we might think it is. And not quite as, to the extent that it does have values, it's not quite as selfish mm. as we think it is. And even if it is selfish, that there is something at work mm. that brings it all together in the end in a way which is better than if everything were planned for us by experts. Mm. Now, to unwrap, now, how the moral sentiments fits into all of that is really, I think, beyond the scope of today. I just mention it because there's this other book, and Adam Smith had the opportunity several times to, to uh, disown one, to, uh, no, but he didn't. So let's presume that Adam Smith is in tune with himself <laughs> and that we will just work with that. All right. What is, what is similar in Smith to Locke? The answer, I think, is that the well-being of a nation is central to the enterprise. Mm. And if we were to summarize Adam Smith's approach, what he calls the natural system of liberty, uh, or the system of natural liberty, he doesn't mention the word capitalism, and we can talk about that. But it's this. The well-being of a nation depends upon the wealth of a nation. The wealth of a nation depends upon the productivity of labor. The productivity of labor depends upon the division of labor. And the division of labor depends upon the extent of the market. That, in a nutshell, is Adam Smith's uh, approach. So the nature and the causes of the wealth of nations depends upon those variables which I just mentioned to you. So what he's getting at, if we start off, the wealth of the well-being of a nation depends upon its wealth. Well, what is the wealth of a nation? Many people at those in those days, like what we call the mercantilists, believe that the the wealth of a nation could be measured in terms of how much money it has or the wealth of a nation could be measured in terms of whether or not it had a favorable balance of trade with another nation or a favorable balance of payments with another nation. And that the nation became important as, they, as, the, as, sort of as the variable. And policy was determined in terms of what was best for the nation in a potentially hostile world. Well, Smith is going to suggest that the less that government does in those areas, the, the better off the well-being and wealth of the nation is going to be. So the well-being well of a nation depends upon its wealth. All right, so how do we generate wealth? Not just by accumulating money, but by work, mm. which means labor. In its most simple form, that's lock, labor. But how do you make labor productive? The answer is you specialize. And that uh, Smith's very, very simple example of specialization is the pin factory. Mm. And on the front of this book, on, the, on, on, on your left-hand side, is the pin factory, which is uh, the idea of capitalism at work, division of labor. And that picture is derived from the British pound, the 20, 20 pound bill. It's on the 20 pound. So there's the picture. On the other side, you have um, uh, from Les Mis by uh, Victor Hugo, which I did that sort of, that's Rousseau come alive, the angry person without food or anything. So you've got the busy worker, the busy bee on one side and the angry uh, individual on the other, and it sort of capturing the, the sort of result of Locke and, and Rousseau, the pin factory. That's what he means by a division of labor. Somebody's making the top of the pin, another one is 
shaping it down so you can become specialized. That's what, so the division of labor concept is that we specialize. Okay, so the wealth of a nation, the well-being of a nation depends on its wealth. The wealth of a nation depends upon the productivity of labor. You make labor more productive, that is it creates more output and also becomes more um, entrepreneurial when it is specialized. So that he, as, as Smith remarks, in a more civilized country, there is no doubt in Smith, it's a civilized world and it's an uncivilized world. The same thing with law. And civilization has to do with well-being and, and, and being um, well-fed and well-clothed and well-mannered. And Rousseau is going to look upon all of that as, as just piling it on more and more nonsense. But he's, he, he says, Adam uh, says that every improved society that's unimproved, underdeveloped, and improved. The farmer is generally nothing but a farmer. Manufacture is nothing but a manufacturer. That is goodbye jack of all trades. And so now we get a person who you can call a dean, which requires apparently some knowledge and specialization in order to perform such a task. You wouldn't want to get anybody off the street to do that. And you certainly wouldn't want to get a farmer or a manufacturer. So we've become specialized in the improved and civilized world. Okay. Now we move to the next one, which is the division of labor depends on the extent of the market. Well, what does that mean? Just think, just think about hospitalization and, and, and the medical enterprise for a moment. If you're living in a rural area, you're not going to get the kind of service and high, high tech service that you would get if you live in a city where you have these specialized hospitals and you get these doctors who don't everything about a kidney but know nothing about anything else. But that's the point that they do know the kidney, whereas the rural doctor is going to be somebody who's going to be more like a jack of all trades, where that's, that's your GP. But you, the GP you would go to for a specialized operation. But how do you get a specialized operation? Well, there is a market. And then with the specialization, you extend the market. And then the market can absorb more. Now, that's the idea of a well being of a nation. Uh, how, you, how it lined up thus for Smith, the two great discoveries in the history of the world. Now we think, all right, we could, we could play that game. What two great discoveries do you think uh, uh, sort of define the world? And uh, I, mean, I can think of, of, of a couple. Uh, but let's, let's ask Adam Smith. And the answer is the discovery of America and the discovery of the Cape of Good Hope, because that expanded the market. It expanded the world. It became more global. It became more interconnected. Um, and so trade, could, uh, why is it that cities in those days anyway, up until now, cities are emerged on the coasts? Hmm. And the reason we could have a port. And what's the good about a port? It has a ship. What is good about a ship? It can send cargo. And that is how the world turns. Mm -hmm. And so that, is, that becomes the model. Okay. Now, okay. The next stage in this, so that's stage one, trying to flesh out that well being to wealth, the division of labor, the extent of the market. The next thing to figure out is why is this all natural as far as Smith is concerned? He's, his point is, Nobody had to sit down and work this out. It comes naturally. And his example is, let's compare a human with a dog. And this is because this very, this is very important in those days. To, 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 is there anything distinctively human? And Aristotle would say, yes, it's speech. 
and well, well don't otters and all that people kind of squeak and do all kinds of things, but it's not speech. So we get into this whole argument. Are is there something unique about human beings? And then comparing them with non-human beings becomes the the, the, the sort of the, the task. Um, and Rousseau would say, well, there's something called sympathy in both. And so we're all part of the animal kingdom. But what is critical for, for Smith is the example of a bone. Would dogs cooperate over exchanging a bone? The answer is no, they'll fight over the bone. Human beings, on the other hand, are inclined by nature to exchange. That is, I work, I specialize, I get five books. Well, I don't really need five books. Maybe I just need three, a couple for backup in case of emergency. So I have a surplus, which is two. And I run into Pete who's got five eggs, but he really doesn't need five eggs. All he needs is three eggs or two eggs. And, but he would like a book and I'd like an egg. And so it's natural, we exchange. And that is natural, says, says Smith. We don't have to contrive that. It's part of human nature to exchange, to barter, to engage in this. But he said, well, that's pretty simple. You have to find Pete with two eggs and me with two books. Well, that's where the invention of money comes in. With the invention of money, I don't have to barter in exchange. I can just pay you for the two eggs because you'd rather have the money than my two books. And then you can go out with your money and buy two whatever it is that you want. So that, that is, this is all natural. So money fits in and you might have to charge interest here and there. You know, see, this is a wholly different, a completely different story than, than if you had to start back with Aquinas and Aristotle and start talking through this. It, it's, it's, it's the well-being is attached to the wealth of a nation. It's here on earth, it's, that, that, that is the issue. Now, <clears throat> okay, so that's point number two, is that it's, it's natural. And the idea is in how, what way is a human being different than another animal? And the answer is a human being can learn, they learn by their own experience, and they exchange for one another, and the well being goes up, and their productivity goes up, and therefore happiness goes up. And just on that, go ahead. Note, Professor Lloyd. Mm -hmm. So, but uh, there's a point you're making, I think it's worth drilling down on, is that there is actually mutual benefit in that exchange. That is correct. Right, that, that both conditions are made better through the medium of exchange. That it's not necessarily the case, as others might argue, that one is trying to put something over on something, somebody else, or that there's necessarily greed uh, wrongly understood uh, that, is, that is motivating this. That is correct. Um, <clears throat> And thinking about what we're going to talk about today, I reread uh, some of Smith's Wealth of Nations, and I was looking to see the extent to which the word cooperation entered. And uh, Smith, right at the end of chapter one, I say all these things and consider what a variety of labor is employed about each of them. We shall be sensible of that without the assistance and cooperation of many thousands, the very meanest person in a civilized world could not be provided, even according to what we very falsely imagine, the easy and simple manner in which he's commonly accommodated. I think, hmm. I wake up in the morning and one of the first things I want to do is read a paper. But I have to have a cup of coffee first. I get a cup of coffee <laughs> and with cream in it. And I go outside, I get the newspaper. I sit down on a turn on the light bulb. It, 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 hopefully a paper comes out early. And I'm reading the paper and I close out and then I go to the, can you imagine what it took to get that paper at my front door with a copy of it? But the, that, so the, yes, there's competition. That is, I can get the LA Times or the Washington Post or I can get the New York Times or whatever it is. There's a variety of newspapers I can get. But it requires a certain, within that, it requires a cooperation. It requires the cooperation of the printers, 
the advertisers, et cetera. I don't need to tell you, I think you can get the picture. So cooperation is an important part of this market system as well as competition. Competition keeps the price down and the productivity high. Cooperation is what is needed in order to become an exchange economy in which we in fact become all merchants. Hmm. All of us become merchants, buying and selling or renting or whatever. Um, and here's his, he can anticipate the, in, in fact, he anticipates the Rousseau critique and the subsequent critique. So that, that so this meanest person in the civilized world, me, uh, could not live what I've just described without the assistance and cooperation of many uh, others. Um, compared indeed, so here's a comparison to make. Compared indeed with the more extravagant luxury of the great, his accommodation, this meanest person in civilized society, must no doubt appear extremely simple and easy. That is, there is a huge gap in this society. So I read the LA Times, somebody may be able to have all four papers. Mm -hmm. And I live in a, in a condo and somebody else may be out to live in a 5,000 5, square foot house. Right. So, that, that, so there is going to be a difference once you, once you adopt this system of natural liberty, you let mm. people free to exchange, you're gonna get that, mm. all right? But should I be upset with that inequality? Very good. And he says, uh, compared, it must seem it, uh, extremely simple and easy. And yet it may be true, perhaps, he's he's bad, but this is where he's going, that the accommodations of a European prince does not always so much exceed that of an industrious and frugal peasant, of the accommodation of the latter, the frugal peasant, exceeds that of many an African king, the absolute master of the lives and liberties of 10,000 naked savages. Mm. Right. I mean, so there's a huge difference. I mean, Rousseau is not mentioned, mm. but I find it extremely difficult not to read this part as saying the naked savage is somebody who's living in an uncivilized life. Right. The noble savage, then, to borrow his phrase. That's right. The noble, that is not a noble life. That is not a noble life. Right. That's right. Because he's going to get governed by somebody else. But it that's is understood that there will be inequality. But even in the inequality, that is still superior. You've got to compare something to something. That's correct. Yeah. Very good. So that, the, so that one of the things we're going to get out of the system is inequality. Yeah. That's understood from the beginning. Completely. Yeah. But what you're also going to get is liberty. So how do you, and, 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 but then so it requires a certain kind of morality mm. to live in such a society. Mm. So I would say part of civic education is not to take the word civic education to be an absolute word. So that every, every person in every country receives the same civic education. It's not like physics. So the, the kind of civic education one would get in a Smith society is what kind of education do you need and should get to live in a commercial republic? Mm. And that is going to mean how do you get the tools in order to, to succeed in such a society and at the same time become a good citizen? And that becomes a very interesting question. Can you, can you pursue commerce and be a citizen? Right, but even to that point, that, that civics education, which is often conflated today with kind of learning facts and figures, it's not even just about preparing citizens to interact in a democracy. It's about preparing them through an inculcation of mores to interact in a capitalist society as that, well. That is correct. Right. So it's not, it's not just about get out there and vote. The education no. should also prepare people to live in a society that will have this inequality, but then what is your responsibility for living in that? That's correct. In civilized society, a person stands at all times in need of the cooperation mm. and assistance of great multitudes, while his whole life is scarce sufficient to gain the friendship of a few persons. Mm. In almost every other race of animals, each individual, when it has grown up to maturity, is entirely independent. 
And in this natural straight state has occasion for the assistance of no other living creature. But man has almost constant occasion for the help of his brethren. And it is in vain for him to expect it from their benevolence only. Mm. He will be more likely to prevail if he can interest their self-love in his favor and show them that it is for their own advantage to do for him what he requires of them. And that passage has been taken as a condemnation of Smith's whole wealth of nations. It's based on selfishness. Mm -hmm. It is based on fooling the other person. Yes. Okay. Yes. Now, let me try and give it a slightly different twist. The benevolence for, for my food and shelter and clothing, if I rely on the benevolence of another person, I'm a beggar. Mm -hmm. Now, if you can, you can right. properly create a civic education for beggars. Right. Right. How do you become a better beggar? Right. The and, and how do you create a society that demands the, the forced giving of one to another, too? Well, that 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 is yes. Why? That's right. Right. So, we benevolence is a good thing. Yeah. But why can't we? Uh, do it through what comes more naturally as why not do it through cooperation? Yes. I mean, at least stand on the side and say, we'll clean for mm -hmm. food mm -hmm. as you're making an exchange, you're mm -hmm. making an offer. So the only beggars rely on the benevolence of others. Self-reliant people have got to be able to persuade mm -hmm. another person. So now you get into the, how do you persuade? And the persuasion that Smith is, is, and this gets people really kind of edgy, the kind of persuasion that Smith is suggesting is, it is in vain for me to expect from you benevolence only. Hmm. And therefore, I will be more likely to prevail if I can interest you in your favor and show you that it is for your own advantage to do, to do for me what I what I really want you to do. So, so that you say, well, that's a bit naughty. That's a bit edgy, isn't it? Well, I think it is a little bit. But at the same time, if you're going to live in a society which is a democratic commercial, you have to persuade people. Yes. And that is very difficult because the art of persuasion may involve the art of hype. It may involve the art of lying. It may get the art of fear. Mm -hmm. So that one might say there is uh, there's a certain way in which we have to learn how to persuade within reason. That and that means me. I have to interest you. Tell you that that um, all right. I want a job. I have to persuade you that it is in your interest to hire me. Yes. And then and then it's in a free society. It is up to you to figure out whether you've been had. Yeah. Or whether it's in your interest to do that. And then you have to negotiate with me. And part of the negotiation is I'm not interested. Mm -hmm. And you walk away. And I, and I shouldn't be, I shouldn't, I guess, according to the Smith model, shouldn't pout, shouldn't try and get back at you. I should go on now and try somewhere else. Mm -hmm. So there's the morality, the moral sentiment if you want to do. Mm -hmm. And I, uh, and, yes, and, Let's put it down in this way. He has a bit of it, and I'm building on it. It's not, uh, how do I get my bread, beer, and beef? It's not by from the benevolence of the baker, the butcher, and the brewer. Brewer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. It's a cooperative effort. It's a competitive effort but it is also a cooperative effort. And I think that's the model that Smith leaves with us. Yes. And we have to figure out whether that is selfishness, greed, as Smith has been criticized, or is it a system which is, com which is compatible with liberty mm. and law and order? This is tough because in the past, it's very easy. You want order, get rid of liberty. You want liberty, get rid of order. So this is a huge experiment that Locke and Smith are engaged in. But as you've done in this series already, starting with 
Rousseau and Locke. And in these next two classes, where obviously today we're with Smith, next class is going to be with Marx. You always have to compare something to something. Mm -hmm. I think sometimes where we get into this argument that, that it's a condemnation of, of Smith as Smith without really taking on having the, frankly, intellectual fortitude to put something else forward that is worthy of, of attack, right? Mm -hmm. And so in this, obviously Smith is arguing, A, that this is a, a natural state of man uh, to cooperate, but there, there, is, there is something worth critiquing in a society that only depends on benevolence. Yeah, and, the, and the answer is that I, yeah, yeah, that means that I cannot take care of myself. Yes. And that, Smith is saying, and Locke is saying, goes against the natural inclination. The natural inclination of human beings is to preserve themselves. And there isn't a, an environment that encourages the pursuit of happiness through the practice of your skills and labors. Is that fair? Uh, y y yes, yes. Um, now, I don't know where all the wealth of the benevolent person came from. Right. They may have just inherited it. See, we go back to primogenitor. Yeah. I mean, Smith has a long section on why primogenitor is fundamentally wrong. Yeah. Why, uh, why colonialism is fundamentally wrong. Yes. And he is very much in favor of American independence. This is written in 1776 also. And he thinks that the colonists have a very good argument. Yeah. And, and so this is a, yeah, this, this is a challenging, a, a, a challenging thesis that, that he is offering. Now, I mean, that is the natural system that I've just described to you. Now, there are going to be imperfections in real life. And one of the imperfections is going to be mercantilism that comes up and tariffs. And so what do we do? Well, we have to resist those through education and gradually move towards a system of competition and cooperation. Mm. Uh, So anyway, I, I, I want to end this point about the natural system where that it's a natural inclination of human beings to truck, barter, and exchange. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. I want to, I can't leave this without, uh, Smith, without talking about uh, three other quick points in the 10 minutes that we have left. Point number one is the invisible hand. Uh, what is it? Where does it happen? That occurs in book four of the Wealth of Nations in which he's way into his natural system. And it occurs in book four where he's dealing with the mercantilist saying, well, you know, we have to we we have to put a tariff here because we want it. We want this. We want this individual to put the money there. We want to do what just we want to direct it and, and be in, be in charge. And Smith's point in, in the invisible hand is that even if human beings don't intend the public good, they are led. Um, that every individual therefore endeavors as much as he can to employ his capital in the support of domestic industry. The point is the mercantilists say, I don't want capital going abroad. I want it to stay at home. Mm. And therefore I'm going, to I'm going to tax you if you take your products and your jobs abroad. I want it here. Okay. He says, well, even if you, uh, it, 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 an individual is in more inclined to stay home than go abroad, because he could trust, he could see it, he's right at home anyway, so why are you doing all of this? Um, he generally indeed neither intends to promote the public interest, nor knows how much he's promoting it. By preferring the support of domestic to that of foreign industry, he intends only his own security. 
and by directing the industry in such a manner as its produce may be of the greatest value. It can't own his own game. And he is in this, as in many other cases, led by an invisible hand to promote an end which no part, was no part of his intention. And so many people have grabbed that to say that Smith doesn't have the faintest idea what he's talking about. This is not science. It relies in the end on an invisible hand to pull everything together. What is this invisible hand? And it's only one page, but it has taken up um, books and books dealing with it. Uh, it's very difficult to explain. The phrase invisible hand only appears on one page. That is correct. It appears two other places on one page in the theory of moral sentiments and in his essay on astronomy, where the invisible hand becomes Jupiter. Okay, all right? Yep. Uh, notice here it says it, he's led by an invisible hand. Now, those people who are more market oriented and want to defend this, like, like Milton Friedman, and you will see it. They will, they will, and, and in interviews with economists, I said, so where does this phrase happen? Where does this phrase occur? And what does it say? And nine out of 10 will say the following. And as in, this, as in many other cases, is led as if by an invisible hand. As if is added. Smith does not say as if. So which, which increases the problem. So what is, is something that does exist then? It's not as if. Very good. But my explanation of what this invisible hand business is comes in the next um, uh, uh, sentence. Nor is it always the worst for the society that it was no part of it. By pursuing his own interest, he frequently promotes that of the society more effectively than when he really intends to promote it. I have never known much good done by those who affected to trade for the public good. It is an affectation indeed, not very common among merchants, but very few words need be employed in dissuading them from it. If I could translate that as, look, human nature is inclined to trade, barter, and exchange. For our own benefit and the benefit of us, we need to cooperate and discuss them with each other. But even if we're not, the system, the, the way it works, the market works so that it, everything turns out all right. We don't need planning. Mm -hmm. Because this whole truck barter exchange is, is something which is natural to human beings. You don't need human wisdom. Human wisdom usually fails. Mm -hmm. The other two points we might have to wait on. No, but let me get, do it quickly. Yeah, all, all right. right. Two, two, two other points. The, the two other points is, is that as a one, one paragraph in book five, which deals with the division, downside of the division of labor. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's really a very, very critical, in which we are left with this paradox. The paradox is without the division of labor, we will not have the well-being of the society, correct? Mm -hmm. that's, what, that's what we did in part one. Mm -hmm. Now he's talking about what does the division of day labor do for the human being? Mm. And his answer is it turns him into the most narrow individual in the entire world. Because can you imagine I put in a pinhead? That's what I do every single day. Put a pinhead on. What do I learn how to read? Do I learn how to write? What kind of what kind of person do I become? Mm. And so Smith is in one page, says that. And he moves on. <laughs> That's just a trade-off yeah. to go back to it, right? right? That one page becomes the centerpiece of Marx's work. Mm. That is the, that is not the division of labor becomes the alienation of labor. Mm. That we're all alienated from ourselves. This is a dead-end job. Work is not something to do. We should become jack of all trades. Mm. And the last point I wanted to make was, well, where does government fit in? And primarily government's role is to make sure this system works, no crooks, no nothing, keep out as much as possible, but encourage public works, encourage commerce, encourage canals, encourage those kinds of things to do things which, which one could not do by oneself, 
or at the local level, you couldn't do it by oneself. So externalities, and so the government should do it. And primarily, the government should be involved in education. Mm. The education of people who suffer from the division of labor. And so the, what this point is, is to teach people young how to read, how to write, the basics mm. of living so that when they do get old, they can read a newspaper, so that they can be able to participate in the in, in civic discourse. Mm. Because the, the nature of the job of specialization turns you into narrow people. So the job of the government is to educate the youth, to educate, to provide enough skills so that you can become a citizen in such a republic, a commercial republic, which is good for the republic. So what the government should do for you mm -hmm. is to provide you with the skills to live in that kind of republic. And of course, there should also be a civil society that also creates or inculcates these, these values uh, and this, this broad-mindedness, right? I'm, I'm thinking now of Tocqueville talking about the importance of, of religion, yes. seeing it from a civic standpoint, which is to say that, that religion, and he's speaking across the major faiths, actually uh, give people a, a more eternal perspective that sometimes in a, that in a democratic society, if you're the one putting the pins, pinheads on the pin, you can really just be completely wrapped into a very temporal mindset. And so it's, it's even more important in those kinds of environments, especially given the, 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 the greater benefits that you're talking about, to find those other ways to take your mind, if not your spirit, outside of the factory. That is correct. And I think, and that is a, an important, so I think one of the important questions that needs to be asked with regard to capitalism and socialism is what are the role of government? Hmm. And I, I, those in favor of Smith's system have often been accused of saying it's what they want is a do nothing government. Hmm. And the point is, I don't think they say they don't want, they want to do nothing government. They want a government to do the right thing. Yeah. And the right thing is to pick up on encouraging a commercial society through canals and roads, etc. And also to protect the citizens from the downside of such a society. And a test of whether the well society is well-being or not for Smith is the condition of the working class. Mm -hmm. So we have a question in, and uh, I think we've been, we've been talking around it. And I would just note, uh, Dr. Lloyd, that behind you, as we look out into the Pacific, there is a, a freighter ship that is taking goods <laughs> from one place. From Long Beach. <laughs> That's right. So ca yeah. capitalism is happening yeah. as, as we speak here. Uh, trade <laughs> is happening. Um, so what is the, a question raised, what is the point of broadening a person's perspective if they are forever in this kind of cog and wheel kind of system. Um, now again, I think it's, I think one of the things that's been so effective about this class is you need to compare something to something. And next week, mm -hmm. we'll obviously be taking on Marx, who very much is, that's, that's his attack on capitalism, but we'll, we'll certainly evaluate Marxism and what it has to offer. Because if there's a, if there's a cog in the wheel system, it's Marxism. Well, to go back to your point, there's a trade-off. Right. So to answer the person's question is that there's a trade-off. All of the, you know, why educate somebody if they're going to be a cog and wheel? Cog? I, I, that's, I, that's how I understand the question. Yes. The answer is because they're in a cog and wheel, you need you need to do that. Right. Otherwise, you become a heartless society. Right. And this is the point: is is a pro-capitalist society a heartless society? And the answer is no. Yeah. There's a role for government, but a proper role. Yeah. And is it fair to say, though, and, and this certainly this, this cog and wheel um, metaphor also assumes that your entire identity is within the work that you do. And I think what Smith would say as well is that it, 
that your work in a capitalist system isn't your entire identity, that, that it provides, it does indeed, the system provides these other freedoms and opportunities to actually explore the other dimensions of your, yourself and, and other modes of cooperation. So you meant, yeah, yeah. yeah and link, link to that, you mentioned earlier about Tocqueville and religion. Mm. Uh, Smith has a part where, where it's the role of the government to encourage a variety of religions. Mm. Yeah, so you have a choice, no religion at all, because religion can be factious. That's Marx. Yeah. You can have one religion, which becomes the orthodox, the, the tradition that Locke and, and, and Smith are facing. Or you can have a multiplicity of religions mm. in which religion then gets to somehow, under this theory, gets to do the good things for the, for the human being right. without having to take on the big things and bad things about fighting each other and killing each other in the Crusades. Mm. So it becomes, again, part of the improved civilized society is a tolerant society. Yes. But at the same time, you have to have virtue. You have to have bourgeois virtues. S speak a little bit about that. We've, we've got about 10 or 15 minutes here. Well, it's, again, it's not from the benevolence of the butcher and baker that we get a, a meat, a beef and bread, but it's by self-reliance. And we have to get the skills to, to do that. Mm -hmm. We need to be able to show up on time, mm -hmm. leave on time, mm -hmm. deliver properly on time. To be, uh, I don't think being polite is necessarily being inauthentic. Mm, very good, which Marx would say. Yes. Yeah. All of this is just a big, big put on. And Rousseau before. And Rousseau before. All these manners are, are yeah. really, you know, restrictions or strictures that we put on ourselves. Smith completely flips no. that. That's right. You have you have to be able. To, I mean, look at the pit of fact it requires. You know, mm. it, it requires. I'm doing this job. You're doing that job, and it um, and you're doing it well. And you're doing it well. Otherwise, we get somebody else. Right. Well, then I'm out of a job. Um, rely on the benevolence of the of the person coming down the street. Then, if that's what you want to be. Mm. So that's why bourgeois values means that you don't make. I think the worst is to be a beggar. Mm. Right. Because, and what it does to you yes. as well. Oh, right? yes, 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 yes. yes, yes. yes. Well, that, there's a situation where what is good for the, what is bad for the society is also what is bad for you. Mm. Very good. Yeah, you yeah. can't have a nation of beggars. Right. And I think what is interesting is Smith, the title is, an inquiry into the nature and causes of the wealth of nations. I've sat back over the years and thought, why didn't he write a book calling, write, write a, a book called An Inquiry into the Nature and Causes of the Poverty of Nations? Hmm. So once you start focusing on increasing the wealth of a nation, you're buying into a whole bunch of values or support systems that would need to support that and defend it. And to take, and I haven't thought about this, uh, Professor, but the fact that writing at that time, 1776, obviously, is when this, that, that the poverty of nations would actually be a more representative condition for the world at that time. Correct. Hmm. And therefore, is all of us, are all of us going to be um, the, the life of Solomon Grundy? Hmm. All serfs? And that's why he says, Isn't it, are, if, however badly off you think you are compared to those who are doing well, remember, remember the alternative. Yeah, right. Compare something to something. So we have a, a question here in our last uh, five or six minutes here um, about the invisible hand again. Oh, yes. And I, I have to say, even as someone who's uh, sat under your your teaching and have gone through uh, both the wealth of nations and, and theory of moral sentiments. I did not know until today that the phrase "invisible hand" appears uh, so rarely in in Smith's writings. But 
how so you're you're saying then that the invisible hand as smith understands it does he see a spiritual dimension to this or is it really connected to nature in the sense that this that he's a, he's saying this out of observation to the reality of the world that he sees around him. Well, that yeah. thank goodness we only have five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Well, the in the wealth of nations, there is no explicit uh, association of the invisible hand to a god or. A, or a visible, a, a hand behind the scene controlling things mm. and making it all work. Mm. In his astronomy, it's Jupiter. Mm. He's doing it. Mm. And it's, um, and then in the um, theory of moral sentiments, he has, well, it's, uh, They are led by an invisible hand to make nearly the same distribution of the necessities of life, which would have been made had the earth been divided into equal portions among all its inhabitants, and thus, without intending it, without knowing it, advance the interests of the society and afford means to the multiplication of the species. When providence divided the earth among a few lordly masses, it either forgot or abandoned those who seemed to have been fit, have been left out in the partition. Uh, that's. That's mm. of the three references to the invisible hand that, I've, that I know of. There may be one floating around somewhere else. But in the moral sentiments, the invisible hand is linked to providence, but as a corrective of providence or working with providence. Mm. So you've got a providential, but a pro this is really linked to Locke. I mean, in the beginning, God gave the world to man in common. Mm. Or here, when Providence gave the world to somehow, you'll be lords, you'll be serfs, you'll be such and such. Um, then there's an invisible hand which comes along. Mm. Um, so, the, the best that, again, the best that I can come up with is a case that the invisible hand is not the visible hand. Mm. The visible hand is somehow you need mercantilists, you need planners, you need the expert administrator mm -hmm. to sit at the helm and watch the ship and guide the ship. Otherwise, they will be chaos. Mm -hmm. And he is, his point is if you leave things alone, yeah. they work out. You don't need to be a control freak or you don't need to be a planning freak. That's not to say you don't need the rule of law. Yes, or that you don't need a certain set of mores that need correct. to be inculcated into this environment. Absolutely. Right. I, know, I, know, I, I, totally, I totally agree. And that's what I mean by bourgeois values. Yeah, yeah. And it means hard work. And somehow, somehow the system, there's a natural system so that you don't go out and sell chaos. <laughs> what you're going to say is by relying on the wealth of a nation to, to support the well-being of mankind, which is the ultimate ethos, you are not going to lead life into chaos. Mm. There will be inequality, but the whole level, it's not a, another way of putting it, is that it's, life is not a fixed pie, mm. a zero-sum game. Yeah. The idea is improvement. Yes. And here, I'm giving you the formula for improvement. Mm. And and it works, but it certainly works mentally for Smith. Mm. You see, and those people who don't, within the last hundred years, religion has come under considerable attack. Mm. And particularly if you rely on religion or some kind of reference to religion to support your doctrine, then somehow the doctrine is not worth mm. So that if you were to support the Declaration of Independence, you don't want to say um, the, the reference to the Almighty. Right. You, you want to somehow secularize it. Mm -hmm. And so those people who like capitalism, like Milton Friedman, have to deal with the invisible hand, which is thrown at them by the scientists. Mm -hmm. 
right? And frequency responses as if led by an invisible hand. Yes. So it becomes more of a proposition yep. to, be, to be proven or not proven. Yep. And then, and so if it works, then the proposition is there. I Smith, don't have says, to, Smith says it is a vis, an invisible it, hand. Now deal with it. That is correct. Uh, that, uh, that, and the role of philosophy is to bring system to the world. So he's brought a systematic understanding of why you should leave people on the whole to their own devices. Mm -hmm. Because we're cooperative, we want to get ahead in life. We're, um, and that doesn't mean to say that we will be unkind to our neighbors. Yeah. yeah. So we will be kind, but we've got to, we're, we have to be self reliant. Right. And, and, and somehow, somehow, nature, if we leave the providence of God or as if, I probably said one side, the best I could come up with again is some Kantian notion or Hegelian notion of the cunning of the nature. Mm. Nature has a way of playing tricks on us. That's sort of insight. But we do whatever we do, we, we plow, we do this, and then there's a flood. We do, we do, do such and such and such. And Mother Nature, as the yeah. series goes, as you know, you can't trick, play fool with Mother Nature. Well, does that, what does that imply? Na Mother Nature has a has a plan. Mm. That, that, and so, so you got like history will judge us, or you have nature will judge us, yeah. or you have God will judge us. Mm -hmm. And, and so, so that nature is cunning. Mm. I want to conclude here, and I've, I've added just a couple minutes here to the end of class, because somebody uh, brought up a question as it relates to the question of beggars, which I think in some ways draws a larger uh, discussion around the criticism of capitalism being inequality. And the question is posed in a way to say that Smith hated beggars uh, and loved landlords. Now, I think it's, again, we're going to explore Marx next week and, and evaluate his set of arguments. You haven't said that in this discussion, uh, but I also believe Smith doesn't say that either. He is speaking, would it be fair to say that he is speaking more about the fact that the act of begging, the necessity of begging, that that particular action can be degrading to the person who does it. And to have, so that's the individual perspective, but again, this is the wealth of nations. So if there were to be a nation of beggars, that there is something necessarily degrading about that. It's not a hatred of, of beggars as much as a hatred of the necessity for the act of begging. Uh, I, would, I, would, I would agree with that. I would agree with that. And, and, and suggest that, that where there are beggars, there are landlords. Mm. In other words, when you're talking about feudalism, you've got two classes, the landlords or the landowners, and you've got the serfs. And in order to, in, in, in order to bring up the life of the, of the serf, you have to remove the, the, the possibility of begging. Mm. And begging is linked to primogenitor. That, that is, mm. uh, how does the serf live? At the mercy yes. of, uh, and, and benevolence of the, of the landlord. Smith is attacking a culture and society and system. That is begging. correct. Yes. That is correct. Yeah. Are you describing the life of junior faculty? Or? No. no, deans. We are on here, Bob. We are on. Okay. Well, um, I have to give way to the person who really knows what he's talking about. <laughs> well, that's going to bring us to the end of uh, this session. As you hear, our, our next uh, session with Dr. Kaufman is going to begin at 1130. Uh, I want to thank you all for uh, joining us on this session. Again, uh, next week, we'll be back up uh, with uh, Dr. Lloyd again will be uh, talking about Marx. Uh, that will be next Friday at uh, 10 o'clock Pacific time. Uh, I hope you all uh, enjoy your Easter weekend uh, at the end of this Holy Week that obviously includes uh, Passover on Wednesday. 
Uh, again, all of you and all of those who registered for this class will be sent a link with the video uh, recording of this session, as well as several of the links to the books that uh, Dr. Lloyd referenced here. I want to thank you all again for your time. Please have a, a wonderful uh, holiday weekend. Stay safe. And uh, again, for those of you who are hanging on for uh, our next session, you will need to click the particular video link for the next session. Uh, otherwise, I look forward to seeing you all uh, next week. Take care.